So, every week I intercept around five tons of stuff in the city and I redistribute it to people and projects. And I know you're probably thinking, like, why would a middle-aged mum of three kind of be even able to do that and why would she do it? So I'm kind of going to attempt to explain all the reasoning behind that. And um, the first thing to understand is that the word waste really has bad reputation. So we think of waste as being mouldy or smelly or broken or unusable. And in fact, it's just something that we get rid of that we don't want anymore ourselves. And so, you know, the other reason why I'm able to intercept so much waste is that basically I'm afraid we're all tossers, you know. <laughs> we're part of a throwaway society, whether we like it or not. And, you know, and I'm a tosser as much as you're a tosser. Um, but there are... There are really <clears throat> dramatic implications to our planet and our quality of life and our health through our ability to throw so much away. So being Australian, I kind of feel obliged to state the bleeding obvious. So to start with, I'm just kind of going to explain where all this stuff comes from and the whole process involved in it. Because I think if we understand where things come from, then we value them and we have more respect for them, which would be really good if we could do that. So every single year, year on year, year after year, we harvest and extract around 50 billion tonnes of raw materials. Now, a lot of those raw materials are finite. Once, once we've used them, they don't come back. The planet ain't replenishing a lot of the... Uh, especially a lot of the valuable minerals that we're digging up out of the earth. And... Uh, in that process of uh, extracting the raw materials, what we're doing is making the things for seven billion people that are all wandering around this little tiny planet. But actually, as it turns out, um, it's only the Western world, around 15% of the world's population, get most of that stuff. We, it's disproportionate. Things aren't distributed fairly at all. So I'm addressing us being in rich West country that uh, we have a, a lot of responsibility about the things that we use and consume every day. A lot of pollution is created to make all this stuff. Indeed, this T-shirt I'm wearing now required the same amount of water that I'm going to drink in the next three years just to make one single T-shirt. So next time you go to buy a really, really cheap T-shirt, you might want to consider that something or somebody has been exploited along the way to enable you to be able to buy something so cheaply. The true value and the true cost of making that item is not reflected in the slashed prices that we can buy things at in the Western world. And um, it's just incredibly sad that also the impact of making all this stuff affects the livelihood of people in far-off countries. So we're not exposed to it, we don't see it every day. But the only reason that we can consume so much and have it so cheap is that they're living in really poor conditions and working in poor conditions. And I'm very conscious that we're responsible for so much equality across the world just through the stuff that we endlessly buy. And then, of course, we've got to get it from China or Brazil or India or wherever it's made. And then we've all got to dash to the shops and there are trucks and courier vans zooming around endlessly, just moving all this stuff around so that we can buy it and have it. And then there's the unintended consequences that happen along the way of sort of breaches of what we meant to happen. And there's litter and it's getting into our natural ecosystems and it's polluting the rivers and the oceans, and right now, in the oceans around the world, there's over six trillion pieces of plastic in the ocean. And that's obviously not particularly good for the water cycle. It's a pollutant. Plastic is uh, made from petroleum. It's a fossil fuel product. And it never, ever, ever goes away. It never breaks down. It remains in some form for eternity. And indeed, fish swallow microscopic chips of plastic. So, in fact, we now have plastic in our food chain, which is kind of not ideal. It's not very good for people. 
Uh, and the, uh, the slide that you see on the screen at the moment is from Midway Island in the middle of the Pacific Ocean in a thing called the uh, Pacific Garbage Patch, where there are thousands of square kilometres of ocean that have absorbed the last sort of 40 years of plastic that has uh, escaped being recycled. And most pertinent to what I do is that every single day around the world, we create five million tonnes of waste. And uh, so what do we do with that waste? Well, there is actually a system, and this is used all around the world, on how we should deal with stuff that we discard. And uh, the ridiculous thing is, is that we all agree it would be a great idea to minimise it and prevent it and to reuse what we've already got. And they're at the top of the pyramid you see behind me. But actually what we've done for 50 or 60 years if we, is we've invested at the bottom of the waste hierarchy. So we have amazing factories and processing plants that will destroy objects to get them back down to their base materials so that those materials can be recycled raw materials. And we've built what are called energy recovery facilities, which is a nice euphemism for an incinerator. We burn stuff. Now, if you audit your average black bin bag in the UK, up to 70% of the content is compostable, reusable or recyclable, but we kind of didn't separate it, yeah? We left it in the bag. And disposal on the diagram is landfill. And as you know, we're all obsessed with keeping stuff out of landfill. But I'm kind of, um, I'm conflicted because I'm not sure it's that much better to burn it, although we make a tiny bit of electricity out of burning it. So the doom and gloom that I've just presented to you actually means that there are lots of opportunities for fantastic things to happen. And so I'm going to tell you about some of the things that I've done in the city over the last um, couple of years to um, facilitate reuse. And I think that the saddest thing that, about recycling is that we're just not very good at it. And we've got bins and awareness campaigns and facilities and tips and all sorts of systems so that we recycle, and everyone's obsessed with recycling, but we're not even very good at it. Only 45% of plastic bottles get recycled in the UK. And then, of course, lots of people are lazy or disrespectful or don't know any better or have other issues, which means that they do not get their discarded stuff to the right place. And so in 2014, there were 900,000 fly-tipping incidences around the UK just in London alone, it costs them £25 million every year just to mop up fly tipping. And um, this is why it, it, it's been a fabulous thing for me over the last seven years to be able to build up a really um, flourishing reuse network on the internet. And I did that with hundreds and hundreds of other volunteers all around the UK. And basically, we just want it to be easier for people to not throw things in the bin and to not fly tip them and to be able to pass them on locally so that other people can use them. And so there's a... Freegal is how 2.6 million people do that around the UK. That's an incredibly rewarding thing to be part of. And uh, it's not just about preventing waste because reuse is actually a, a social activity. So you get to meet people and you can help people who may not have enough money to buy the things that they need. So what gets freegal? Just really ordinary stuff. Toasters, sofas, clothes, food, anything that's legal. And you'll see on the chart there that 10% of what gets freegled is DIY. But actually in the real world, about around 33% of all waste is from the construction industry. And so in 2012, I was absolutely thrilled to become part of a project at the University of Brighton. I was invited by a local architect, Duncan Baker Brown, who wanted to involve lots of people in the city to construct a sustainable building to try and avoid some of these big impacts that the construction industry has. And so Duncan and I came up with the idea of building this house he designed out of waste. And we're going to look at it in a minute. And there it is. And it's actually 500 metres from where we're all, we are right now. Uh, it's clad in carpet tiles that have been flipped onto their back. 400,000 tonnes of carpet goes to landfill every single year in the UK. 
It is actually recyclable. Most carpet, by the way, is made out of plastic, but we don't have collection points for it to be uh, recycled. So we were highlighting issues like that in the waste house. And we use normal construction materials, and we also use lots of ubiquitous things that everybody has in their house, which actually you can't recycle, and they're kind of... We have them in volume in lofts and garages everywhere, things like videotapes and cassettes and floppy disks. And uh, we also use normal construction materials like concrete blocks and timber. And I, it was my job to source all the materials for the project. And we actually got 25 tonnes more stuff than we actually needed because stuff just came out of the woodwork, excuse the pun. Um, <laughs> And, um, in fact, we got brand new plywood from Brazil, which was going to go straight to be recycled when it arrived here because it was slightly damaged. And what the waste house has done, really, is just expose all sorts of waste that you can't imagine even goes on. Um, so why would, why would we use toothbrushes? Well, we created really deep interior walls that we could fill with stuff and test them to see if they'd be good insulation. And the thing about toothbrushes is they're kind of usually made from four different types of plastic. And so they're just unrecyclable. And guess how many we make every year? This will shock you. Who wants to have a guess how many we manufacture around the world every year? Anyone? 35 billion. Yeah? So as it turns out, <laughs> why would we need to make that many toothbrushes when, you know, over 5 billion people don't even have enough money to buy a toothbrush? And so they're all mainly coming to the West. Well, actually, we just make them disposable for single use, and we give them out on aeroplanes willy-nilly and in all sorts of places. And so on your uh, left is what 20,000 toothbrushes look like, and they came from Gatwick Airport. And a little company collected them for us in a couple of days, easy peasy, and they paid for them to be brought to us down here in Brighton because that was cheaper than what they paid for them to be disposed of normally. And we also used um, a couple of tonne of denim jean legs. And like, <laughs> who knew that when you buy, buy a pair of shorts, that they probably started life as a pair of jeans. But there is a factory up in Yorkshire that imports 20 tonnes of denim jeans every single year and just chops the legs off and refashions them into shorts. I mean, we are bonkers, right? We're just totally bonkers. And uh, I kind of helped them to when landfill tax increased and they didn't want to send it to landfill anymore, um, I helped them redistribute it. And as a thank you, they sent me two tons of Jen and Jean legs, so that's why they're in there. But anyway, it doesn't look like, you know, a teepee or a hippie tea tree house. You know, it's a beautifully finished um, property that passes all building regulations as won several Royal Institute of British Architects awards. So it is a beacon of sustainability. We created no waste when we built it. I've got to speed up because my timing's way out here. When, <laughs> when I was working on the waste house, I used to go to loads of meetings at the council. I was absolutely horrified because there would be skips outside all the buildings full of reusable stuff. So I suggested to them that they could be a lot more resourceful and not call waste management services, but get me in to redistribute the stuff that they have that they no longer need. Why they have so much stuff they no longer need is because they're going paperless. So they get rid of hundreds of filing cabinets and all the gizmos and gadgets that go with paper and they're modernising their space. And it's not glamorous, it's very messy. It's really dull, boring stuff. And uh, I, I had, one of the fun parts of the job is working with the staff and dealing with human behaviour. And um, there's an awful lot of decluttering that goes on. And, <laughs> you know, I'm faced with this every minute of every day at the moment. Because right now I'm clearing this building down on Hove Seafront and today is the, last, is the day that the last staff member moves out of this building and I'm not there and there's just going to be all sorts of chaos. But if there's one thing I know, there's a whole pile of stuff that we really don't need to manufacture anymore and one of them would be ring binders. So I've got 6,000 of them if anybody needs one. I can supply probably the whole of the UK for the next 10 years. Uh, we don't need to make coat hangers anymore either, or paper clips. Uh, but where we can't get things reused, I try to work with local artists and designers and clever people.
to repurpose stuff and to upcycle it. And we fitted out the whole interior of Silo, a zero waste restaurant a few blocks away. And then stuff like this plastic accessory, students have made prototype new materials and beautiful designer chairs. But the best thing about reuse is I just get to meet lots of lovely people in the city. And uh, not just the hipsters, I get to meet lovely old people like this. And um, the great thing about the council being so innovative in letting me redistribute their unwanted stuff is that it creates so much goodwill with the people in the city. And then I get to meet people like Felix who think it's completely normal and reasonable to pick up a two-drawer metal filing cabinet on a BMX bike. <laughs> God bless him, and he texted me when he got home and it was all uphill. <laughs> and my favourite charity shop in Shoreham, who naturally collects all their furniture in a purple hearse. But hey, it's, it is a barrel of laughs, it's a lot of hard work, but it's incredibly rewarding. So I'm just going to appeal to all of you to find your inner resource goddess, to not trash the planet, and to rethink your relationship with stuff, because it really does matter. We've only got one planet, and we can't recycle it, so please don't trash it. Thank you.